Hello, good morning. You know, it's good to see everybody out. You know, it's been a while since I've been out. I've been trying to stay indoors and too much smoke, right? Um, when you get up in age a little bit, it's kind of hard on the hard on the throat and and lungs. Anyway, enough of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> please rise. Come on, do we speak? Why, Lindum Kulm Jutten can wish Tully has this boost and a lot to see the quest. A has called Kultums to map and ask her health. Tully has to kill your yard sweet. If he is you, he see he is well welted. Not if he is you, who not cooks a lag. Sure, Tully Tully Haha is you. Ulta <laughs> Puti kuala puti ku hui kal smak maku kau stikum te ya yatstim spi kask te stihn te sochtlach. Tali khasti ispu uskna la te silko kast kal kalstum in te akai siusk. And I thank the Creator for allowing me to be here this morning. You know, the things we're going to be talking about today is water. Water is life. Without water, nothing will live. You know, the Okanagan is a growing, growing um, um, entity. It's, it's we're, we're getting too many people. Are they going to bring their water? You know, I see a bunch of high rises, a bunch of cranes, and they're just going up. It's going to be a little mini Vancouver. And where's the water going to come from? The Okanagan Lake, the, the tributaries, or whatever it is. You know, we gotta <clears throat> we gotta be mindful in uh, how to take care of the water. Without water, then we wouldn't be here. But anyway, it's so good to be here this morning. Um, it's so good to to be out and about. Um, so let's sit down. I'll give you guys a language lesson. Well, a couple of them. You know, I keep on hearing, hearing the word seal. That's how it's supposed to be said. Not silks or whatever it is that comes to mind, but seal. We are in the seal territory and we speak in seal. So try that. Seal. <laughs> you know, wherever I go, you know, I always promote humor. For us, uh, <clears throat> for us, humor got us through some very hard times. And that's the past, but it's still here, right? So, what's Okanagan Lake famous for? Water. <laughs> well... But that's what we're trying to look after, right? Oh, Pogo. You guys are scholars. <laughs> anyway, um, Oh, Pogo in my language is Nahahaitk. Try that. Nahahaitk. Can I advise you or not try and I'm going to point you over? <laughs> The first part of that word is haha, which is sacred. Second part of that word is itk, which is water. Sacred being of the water. Ogopogo came to be in 1924 through the Kelowna Board of Trade. In my interpretation of Ogopogo is come, spend your money. <laughs> Humor. I 
try to promote humor. The simple word for water is a siulk. Siulk. Okay, listen, listen. Siulk. Siulk. That's better. You're getting better, right? First part of that word is siust. Human siust out of a cup, out of the cup of your hand from the lake or stream. The last part of that word, siulk is the sound animals make when they lap the water. So it's humans and animals together, not one more important than the other. So with our language, there's always lessons. You know, it, it sounds so simplistic, but it's so deep. <clears throat> so you guys have a wonderful day and um, discuss how we're gonna save our water. You know, when I pray for for water, I pray seven generations ahead. But when I pray for water, it's not only for my great 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 grandbabies; it's it's for yours also. You know, we're all here together, so let's come up with a solution. Thank you, my friends and relatives. You have a good day. We appreciate that. Got a lesson on how to pronounce things this morning. Let's see how well we do. So I would first of all like to acknowledge that we are holding this meeting on the unceded territory of the Seal Okanagan Nation. So welcome to the 2023 annual meeting of OBWB, the Okanagan Basin Water Board. I am Sue Kordoff, Mayor of Osuias and Chair of OBWB. The Water Board was initiated in 1970 as a collaboration of local a collaborative local government agency to identify and resolve critical water issues in the Okanagan Valley. Our vision is to have clean, healthy water in perpetuity while meeting the needs of natural ecosystems, residents, and agriculture now and in the future. Its strength is in building partnerships, bringing people and resources together to plan, educate, pool resources, and advocate for local water concerns to all levels of government. Our team learns from other agencies and applies best practices in dealing with the ever-changing climate and water issues. I would like to acknowledge the Okanagan Basin uh, Water Board, Board of Directors, there are nine of us appointed by the three regional districts. So we are all connected by our water. Streams flow, in, flow into lakes and groundwater connects to streams. We must all work together to conserve our precious resource, ensure water quality, source protection, flood and drought planning. Dr. Sears will expand on this theme in her report but I offer my usual advice on conserving water. Take three minute showers and then turn off the tap. So the second largest use of Okanagan water is lawns and gardens. We continue to pay attention to the campaigns in place to help us use water wisely. The Okanagan water wise message is make water work smarter. This program provides information on annual events aimed at education of children, residents, tourists, and boaters. We know that children in our schools are paying attention to these important issues, and that's where it starts. The Don't Move a Muscle campaign is of immense support, uh, importance to all of us in the Okanagan. The ongoing efforts of this board advocating to the province for inspection stations to prevent the zebra quagga mussels from getting into BC has been a key issue in our daily planning. We are insistent that all out of province boats clean, drain and dry and stop for inspection at border crossings. We also hope that pull the plug legislation is mandated soon. Today's program will be interesting. We will hear from Matthew Bourbonnet, a former wildland firefighter and now an associate professor at UBCO. His topic is fire, water, and changing Okanagan landscape. 
Miss, Mrs. Jackson will present the Make Water Work Challenge Community Winner again, and Dr. Sears will present the annual report. We are a province that burns. If you go back through our history, kind of, well, not so far back in our history, just when we started mapping stuff, in the early 1900s, this is on the map there in the middle. That's all the fires we have mapped in the, in the province that are about over 20 hectares. So you can see there's a lot of gray in the background. That's other years, kind of sometime way before 2017. So there's been a lot of fire. Then 2017, we broke records. 2018, we broke the records again for area burn. In 2021, we didn't break records, but it was a particularly devastating season. So we get a lot of fire. Um, in our ecosystems. It's just how they've evolved and with indigenous you know, use of cultural burning, there was a lot of fire historically on this landscape. If you look at the Okanagan specifically, you can kind of see a little bit of a trend here. So everything in yellow is from like 1919 to 1932. If you look at that, there's a lot of fire on that map from that period. The fires are also a little bit bigger in the south of the Okanagan. And as you go north, they get a little bit smaller. And that's sort of typical of what would have been our, our historical fire regime here would be frequent small fires. And I say small, I mean, White Rock Lake was, you know, a couple 10, I think 20 or 30,000 hectares. If you go to the boreal forest, that's barely a fire. <laughs> um, just the scale is that much different. So that's, that's where you see this real variability across Canada. Fires, as you get is you kind of go through and just look at the fire size. As you get to the kind of the early 2000s and into the uh, 2010s, the fires are getting bigger again. And we can, you know, we know a lot of the causes, well, we speculate on a lot of the causes of this relates to landscape management, fueling of the landscape as we've kind of suppressed fire over time. So this is an example of a picture up near the White Rock Lake fire from the early 1900s. And then the same picture taken by the Mountain Legacy Project just a few years ago. There's an enormous amount of trees in this picture that you wouldn't see in the first one. So in this study, what we did is we looked at climate variables over time from like 1912 right up to 2021. And what we found was just trends all over the place. And so through the middle kind of part of the century, like the 1950s, 1960s, when fire suppression was really ramping up, we were actually in a fairly cool phase in British Columbia. And it's interesting because we had a lot of success with fire suppression. Fire suppression worked really, really well. You can see it down, down there in the bottom left. And despite that, the number of fires over 220 hectares hasn't changed. So we're seeing the same number of fires relatively, but they're getting bigger. And so when we looked at this and we looked at relationships with climate, it's pretty clear that these shifts that we're seeing in sort of climate and weather in the province, especially since the early 2000s, have really resulted in this increase we're seeing in fire in the landscape. And so really what we found and then the big takeaway from this was, the funny thing was, is we were under review for this. So you send out a paper, editors and reviewers send it back and you're doing revisions. And we were doing revisions, and then it hit spring 2023. We didn't reanalyze the data, but we we're just like, well, this is going to be another record breaking fire season. So we just added 2023 into the abstract. And really, what we're seeing across the science is that with these four wildfire blow up seasons in just seven years, and all the things that have happened to humans and in our, in our uh, environment, BC really is kind of in the same stage now that we see in, in terms of wildfire losses, similar to Australia, the Western US, and the Mediterranean in Europe. It's exactly the same trend. We're a little bit behind them, but we've arrived. It's a system, it's called FERNS, and it's managed by NASA. Canada's involved, but it's mainly NASA and the USGS. And it uses a satellite, two satellites, sorry, three satellites called Terra, Mo, or sorry, Terra and Aqua, which are being retired now. They've been up there for over 20 years. And then another one called the Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer. And basically what they are, they have a thermal sensor on them. And so what you can see here, this is August 16th. And we, there's an algorithm that basically detects heat signatures in pixels. And so what you can see up there, those little blips are kind of McDougal Creek, that first day when it just kind of picked up. And what's interesting about this, and the, the challenge we have with monitoring fires, 
is if you think of a satellite being way up in space, how much heat it actually needs to generate before a satellite can actually detect it. So satellites actually aren't that useful for early detection. Most fires start as that wispy little nothing, so they don't put up a lot of energy. So this is August 16th, and there's just something I just want you to just kind of pay attention to. So MODIS will kind of revisit the same area about every half day, so it's pretty good. So this is August 17th. So August 17th is obviously the Thursday, right? So if you look at where the fire is and where those all, all those red pixels are, you don't see a lot of spread. There's actually a little bit of a detection on the, um, the east side of the lake, I guess. But then, obviously that was the night where it really blew up. And that isn't reflected in the data. But then on August 18th, this is what we have. So this is the fire, this is the satellite coming over the next day and picking up all those heat signatures. And so you can think from, like, BC Wildfire Service uses this. You know, situational awareness on fires like this is really, really challenging when it's kind of moving in all these different directions. So we rely on satellites like this. This is why we tell people, never use this to make any decisions on whether you should go or not, because it's not telling you where the fire actually is. So by this point, the fire was already on to, you know, the east side of the lake, and we had those two new spot fires after it jumped the lake. So this is August 18th, then August 19th, we have this really, really quick kind of sit down in terms of fire behavior and McDougal Creek kind of starts running the other way. And then it just pulled up to August 20th and you can see the fires on the other side starting to calm down a bit. So it's all just based on heat signatures from a satellite that can detect them. So if we can understand where we have more deciduous or where we have more sort of fire resistant pockets on the landscape, those can help tailor sort of treatments to, to kind of harden our spaces around that. And we're seeing more and more examples of this kind of across Canada. So I was just on a talk a few weeks ago and we have a project starting up in the Yukon, but around Whitehorse, they've just planted 90,000 aspens. Uh, so they're seedlings, it's gonna take a while for them to become fire resistant, but they'll probably have some pretty good protection because of those aspen uh, in the future. And it's not to say that aspen won't burn, I've been on fires with these gross invasive caterpillars and the fire got into it and it smelled like a barbecue. It's <laughs> the worst thing ever. But you generally don't see crown fire with an aspen, with aspen stands. You see ground fire. And fire on the ground is something that firefighters can work with. Uh, Scott Boswell from OCCP sent me these pictures. This is just up in Wilmington behind our houses and up, up behind Glenmore. So this is, you know, the fire, it's jumped the lake, kind of moved around up above us. But what you can see there, um, if you look at the top and bottom pictures, is a wetland. The fire ran into that wetland and stopped. It's higher humidity, there's a water table there, it couldn't get through that. And the reason it probably couldn't get through that is if you look at the bottom picture, that's a forest that's been treated. So you notice that there's no trees that are torched. There's no crown fire that's gone through that. That fire stayed on the ground. And again, for fire management, that's a fire you can action. When it's up in the crowns and it's running, that's when you're kind of starting to lose, you're starting to lose the fight sometimes. So overhead, and it's firing just millions of lasers per second. It's super cool. Um, they're generally in the near infrared range. And you can kind of see in the diagram there, what they're going to do, that laser is going to bounce off things on the Earth's surface. It could be off branches, it could be off rock, it could be off anything. And that energy then from the laser is going to return to the sensor. And based on the speed of light, we can actually triangulate where that point, what it reflected off of. And so rather than a two-dimensional image, what you get from LiDAR is what we call a point cloud. And so you can kind of see down there in the bottom that big mess of yellow and blue and red, that's a point cloud for about a square kilometer. There's roughly 50 to 70 million points in that point cloud. So it's a super, super rich data set. From that, we can pull out in information on, you know, to do floodplain mapping. So for example, on the right there, you can see a topographic model that we can derive from LIDAR. You can see like trails on it. You can pick up fence lines. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. You but for us, in our interest in fire and vegetation, what's more interesting for us is our ability to actually pick out individual trees. So you can kind of see the vertical thing there, that's, that's a, you know, a ponderosa pine. 
um, that we actually go through and classify. It's, like I said, it always generates like, what are we gonna do? How, 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 do we, how do we adapt? How do we not have this happen again? And I think one of the things that I've always found is that there is no like smoking gun solution. There's no new piece of firefighting equipment that's going to save the day kind of thing. You know, we need to work with fire management organizations on, on you know, there's always innovation to happen with, with air tankers and apparatus and those kind of things. But increasingly, so this is just a burn that I was out in the spring uh, with BC Wildfire Service and Atkin First Nation. And in three days, we managed to burn about 1,700 hectares. It was super, super contained. It was like the awesomest burn I've ever been on. It was so good. Um, and the whole point was to protect the community, but also to ach achieve some ecological objectives, to restore elk habitat, to create you know, new habitat for resources like huckleberry and these other things that are culturally important. And so I think you know, these type of partnerships, I know there's a lot of barriers, but this sort of like boots on the ground style collaboration is, is really the way that we're gonna move ahead with protecting our communities and doing this kind of work. So I guess I'll just wrap up by saying I get to come and present on this. There is a whole pile of grad students who are way smarter than me working on this stuff. I'm just kind of along for the ride some days. So this does reflect a lot of the work and effort that they put in. All the funding partners and collaborators, OBWB, OCCP, there's a whole bunch of others that I didn't have on there. And just thanks for your time. That is a presentation. Oh. Of Our theme was tapping into water solutions because it's a pun and because um, you know water is a universal solvent. And because this is really what the OVWB was designed to do, was designed to take water problems that cross jurisdictions and to create solutions to address them. How, how can we all work together to resolve some of these issues? Originally, it had to do with water quality and pollution, and uh, now it, it is, uh, we work on almost every kind of problem that you can think of that has to do with water in the valley. There, it's a very strong board and very committed to water. The diagram on the left is shows what the water board's jurisdiction is. Now, we are a partnership of three regional districts, but we don't include all of the, all the landscape of all the regional districts. What we are is we are set up on the act, actual height of land boundaries of the watershed. There's a whole logic to being based on a watershed because everything that happens in a watershed affects everyone who lives within that watershed. Um, you can see we're a small organization, but uh, we do uh, really a lot of stuff considering how small we are. So uh, I wanted to also talk a little bit about the Water Stewardship Council for those of you who might not be familiar with them. This is a group that was established in 2006. It was a group of experts, technical experts from across the water sector, uh, everything from people who were experts in agricultural irrigation, to fisheries biologists, to people who are running municipal water utilities, to water engineers, uh, a whole range of different people. They meet once a month, it's all volunteer, and they bring all kinds of ideas and information to the water board. Uh, not They can uh, act as a sounding board when the board of directors has specific questions and needs some technical <coughs> advice. They also um, can make recommendations to the board about particular issues that they see coming up. The principle behind the Water Stewardship Council is there are a lot of issues about water. You could take, for example, the current um, look at the tension that's happening in the Thompson area between the, the uh, irrigators who are um, trying to grow forage and uh, need to maintain um, water in the, in the river, in the Salmon River for, uh, sal for salmon. And that, that, that's a very difficult issue. But what we have in the Okanagan is we have, we have irrigators sitting down at the table with uh, fisheries biologists every month, and so we have an ongoing conversation, so it's not, it doesn't get to that crisis point. That The principle of the Stewardship Council is to get ahead of problems, 
to work them out, to build the relationships, to come up with solutions before the drought happens. So uh, we're really proud of it. And um, that it's just amazing how, you know, after 17 years, it's still so strong and thriving. This is the Water Board's mandate. We were established in 1970. Um, the first meeting, organization meeting, happened in 1968 in Penticton. And from the very beginning, this has been the core of our mandate, all having to do with water figuring out what the specific problems are. How do we define them? What are the priorities among the problems? Is it water quality? Is it water supply? What, what part of the valley is most at risk? To communicate and coordinate between different jurisdictions, between different levels of government, between different parts of the water sector, to present recommendations either to senior government or to local partners, to organize and receive proposals, like we might get a, um, uh, someone might come to, to the OBWB from the city of Penticton and say, can you help us work on this? And then we can put together a bigger project. And then to participate financially in projects on behalf of local government. So the base funding of the water board comes from the local tax base. It's as if that uh, watershed jurisdiction that you saw on the diagram had no boundaries. So everyone, every property owner who pays taxes in the Okanagan pays into our service at the same rate. So it's as if, as if there were no jurisdictional boundaries. And one of our uh, slogans is, um, everybody pays, everybody benefits. We try and focus on uh, projects and programs that benefit everyone in the valley. So we are known for water governance and that people would say, well, the Okanagan Basin Water Board is a water governance organization and different people say that that means different things. But if you look at our letters patent, essentially what we are is we are this structure, this flexible structure, a flexible partnership that the, the main power that we have is to uh, receive funding and to spend money. We don't have authority. We can't tell anybody how to manage the lake. We can't tell anybody to stop watering the cornfield, whatever. We, don't, we can't tell people to do stuff. What we can do is we can enable things. We can build partnerships. We call ourselves a carrot organization. If you're trying to get people to work together, which is what we're always trying to do, you can't be standing there with a big stick behind your back ready to whack them if they get out of line. You got, people have to trust you. People have to want to come to the table. And so we do that by, um, by being this very simple structure to um, make things happen financially. So we pull the valley-wide tax funding. We receive quite a lot of grants from senior government. This year actually was um, an unusually low year for receiving senior government grants. It's highly dependent on that number of grant programs that are out there from senior government. Usually we have very high success rating when we can write grant applications. There just were not very many opportunities in this last fiscal year. I went and looked at our records and our average amount of external grants over the past 17 years was $550,000 a year. Um, the average over the past five years, including this year with very low amount of external funding, over the past five years our average has been $957,000. So you can see it really, there's a big variance depending on the senior funding programs. We act as a grant maker to our local partners. So we have this uh, $350,000 grant program every year that goes back to local nonprofits, local municipalities, um, indigenous organizations to do all kinds of projects and programs um, to improve water quality and water supply. Uh, we also have the, the larger number, the 1.2 million goes out to communities who are building wastewater treatment plants or putting in community sewer, and I'll be talking briefly about both of those. We really like to assist partners to get external funding. So 
Uh, we do a lot of work helping uh, other municipalities or other groups write grant applications or we will write them uh, letters of support for their applications, whether it's to you know, the federal government for an infrastructure plan or to a local community, to a community organization to get a, a, a you know, small amount of funds to do water quality sampling. Uh, we try and support that. Our, our mandate is to bring more water funds into the valley and it does not have to come to us. We just want to uh, increase the level of activity within the valley. And then because we have a, a group of staff that is designated for this, we can create a platform for joint initiatives. Uh, this is, uh, if you've seen the financial, the annual report, you see that we have our audited financial statements in there. We have, um, uh, I just put in this summary slide of the revenues and expenses. Uh, one thing I will note is that it's always uh, different. The, <laughs> the total amount of revenues is always different from the total amount of expenses. And I always need to explain that this is because we are operating continuously with these rolling reserve funds. So we might get, one year we might get a $2 million grant from the federal government, we'll stick it in our reserve fund and then it might take two or three years to spend it. So, but the revenues and expenses are calculated in the year which they're received or expended. So this year it looks like we have way more expenses than we have revenues, but that is just because it balances out through the reserve funds. They wax and wane depending on the level of external grants and the pace that the projects are completed. So over the course of the past 53 years, we've had three main programs, and I'm just going to go through them each. Um, so the sewage infrastructure grants program, as I alluded to, it's a grant from, it's a big, it's essentially a cost sharing program among all the different uh, local jurisdictions in the Valley. So we take local uh, tax dollars and whoever is currently building the next big project, like there's a big wastewater treatment plant that's about to get started in the North Okanagan. It's gonna take a lot of uh, sewage pollution out of the north end of Okanagan Lake. Beneficial for them, the one that you all are probably most familiar with. Uh, this is a slide of um, some staffers from the Okanagan Nation Alliance. We have a partnership with them to do uh, water um, flow monitoring. So this is a picture of them actually going out there, taking the kinds of measurements and that you need to understand what the stream flows are. One of the original uh, uh, aspects of the water management program when it was first uh, formally established in 2006 was this grant program that I <coughs> mentioned before. We're giving out $350,000 a year, up to $30,000 per grant. This picture is not actually black and white. It is Kelowna in the winter time, so the white is snow. And this is a, a photo that we got um, from the staff at the city of Kelowna. They are doing a project which I find it really cool and exciting. They're looking at how the snow removal, you know how when uh, they do snow removal and they pile it in giant filthy mounds and parking lots and on on uh, you know vacant lots, that the the snow off the roads actually has a lot of different types of pollutants in it. It has garbage, it has like brake pad lining and you know exhaust and there's a reason why it's all black and nasty looking. So it, it, the, what this, this uh, project is by the city of Kelowna is looking at how that snow storage might be affecting the quality of the water in the water table. And uh, hopefully this will lead to different communities in the valley making good choices, creating a set of best practices about where to do that snow storage and how to do it in such a way that it, it has a least impact on the, um, on the groundwater. Okanagan WaterWise is another program that you're probably very familiar with. Uh, public outreach, as I said, has become a more and more important part of the Water Board's work. The Okanagan WaterWise is the vehicle for that public outreach. It's, uh, it's designed to 
put all of our work into plain language and get it out there. However, in the media, uh, television clips, um, uh, campaigns and so forth. This particular illustration here is a Know Your Watershed, Choose Your Watershed poster infographic that we give out to whoever wants them, but uh, a lot of times it goes out to schools and places like that, just with tips on how people can help keep their watershed, our watershed clean. Make Water Work, we're demonstrating that right here. This is our summertime campaign to improve uh, people's, the public awareness about the need to conserve water <coughs> and how best to do it. We focus on making water work, because it's, it's, we're not telling people to not water, we're telling it, people when they water to do it in the best way. And when you're planting a garden, when you want to do landscaping, what types of plants and resources are best for this dry climate so that people are not having to grow something super water consumptive uh, when that will, you know, suffer if it's uh, has to if they have to reduce their watering because of drought conditions or something like we're experiencing this this year our other major campaign is this don't move a muscle campaign there's a table i saw outside uh, that we have set up showing um, a lot of our materials that we are giving out putting out to the public we have radio ads billboards, we have all kinds of information. So we had a public campaign on Don't Move a Muscle because we felt that every, it's such an important issue that, and this is the issue of invasive zebra and quagga mussels potentially being brought to the Okanagan. They've come as far west as Manitoba and we want to keep them in eastern Canada and Manitoba and not have them come into the valley because they would spread prolifically and cause really um, so many problems and degrade our environment to such an extent. It's really one of our biggest issues. So we want the general public to understand it because if, if the mussels do come into the Okanagan, it's going to have a huge hit on them as citizens as people are using the lakes and also because it's going to be so expensive to tax dollars so they really we want the public to understand it we uh there's it's, it runs parallel to the provincial program which is focused on boat owners called clean drain dry and um in addition to all of that we're also doing a lot of direct advocacy work uh going in and uh making a lot of recommendations to senior government um, you know, uh, within their different jurisdictions, particularly the province for um, doing more boat inspections to make sure they don't come in. But there's also a, a thing that just started this year is um, under um, initiative of James Litley has been to start developing a a vulnerability guide, a vulnerability assessment guide. So anyone who has like a wastewater treatment outfall or a drinking water intake or any kind of infrastructure in the lake needs to do a vulnerability assessment on that infrastructure and know what they need to figure out how to be prepared in the event that the muscles come in. But uh, I wanted to also mention a few others. So a Sioux who was nipping at your heels for the last couple of years, and Sue will attest to this, 
They came in second <laughs> both times, but only narrowly. <laughs> so nice going to the town of Asius. Also want to acknowledge the city of Kelowna with the most pledges and a nice bump in numbers from past years. I know Ed Hoppy is here from the city. Um, while the Make Waterwork campaign encourages pledging with the announcement of a community champion, and this year we are also giving two $500 Waterwise Yard Prizes to residents who pledge. Um, of course, the, the campaign's ultimate purpose is to bring attention to the Okanagan's water supply at a time when demands for it are highest. So for this, I want to send out a special shout out to all of our local government partners this year and utility partners and business partners who have been promoting water conservation this summer, a summer when it has been critically important. On August 17th, the provincial government looking at stream flows, low stream flows, groundwater levels also low, and the forecast for continuing warm dry conditions on August 17th declared the Okanagan at level five drought, the highest rating possible, indicating exceptionally dry conditions where social, economic, and environmental impacts are almost certain. Being on a call this week with the uh, Thompson Okanagan Regional Drought Team, we know that there are creeks in the South Okanagan where there are fish strandings. So in the three weeks since the declaration, Temperatures are dropping, and that's good. But what we really need is the rain. Nice, gentle, but consistent rain. And until then, as the salmon attempt to return to Okanagan streams to spawn, and <coughs> farmers try to ensure that you can harvest their fall crops, we're again asking everyone to do their part and fo follow local water restrictions. And you can find those at makewaterwork.ca. Armstrong, where's Shirley? <laughs> Armstrong, you've shown yourself to be leaders in this effort. This includes a special Make Water Work garden project that is underway at your new city hall. I've been there twice to visit. And this will serve as an example of all, to all who visit or even pass by on the way to the Armstrong Fair as to how beautiful a space can be when created with plants that are suitable to the Okanagan climate. We're very excited to see this once the work is complete but in the meantime, we want to invite Shirley, Armstrong counselor and gardener, Shirley Fowler, up. And we want to present you and the city of Armstrong with a couple of plants to get you started. They're both on our Make Water Work plant collection list, but they're also on your list of plants that you'll be gardening with or planting. So Shirley, if you'll please come up. Website and not only put in their pledge but also take advantage of the list of plant material that is available for them. I would like to say thank you. I would also, I almost feel guilty, <laughs> uh, Mayor Sue. <laughs> Apparently, um, I have walked into a, a rivalry for the last couple of years between our happily retired ex mayor, uh, past mayor Chris Pieper, and Mayor Sue who have, um, I'm sure you've all heard the cheesy remarks and the whining. <laughs> cheesy remarks from Armstrong and the whining from Masuyas. <laughs> all in good natured fun, of course. And I'm sorry, I didn't know until last night that I was going to be receiving this award today, or I would have gone to the cheese store. It closes at five o'clock and I left at, at 7.30 this morning. So we're going to offer Mayor Sue a lunch at the cheese plant in Armstrong and they can carry on their cheesy remarks and whining at that point. <laughs> I'd also like to say that the Make Water Work project is not just about the friendly rivalry, right, Mayor Sue? 
Um, it's also about raising awareness about the plant materials and it doesn't mean that you can't have your garden, it doesn't mean you can't have your flowers and your mental wellness. It just means that we have to find ways to utilize that water to the best advantage that we can. And I'm so pleased that in conjunction with the Make Water Work Project, Okanagan Basin Water Board, and the Xeriscape Association, that we're going to have our own little North Okanagan demo garden. A lot of the plant material that is Everybody knows H2O gardens and the value that that brings to everybody who likes to garden or who likes to look at gardens. Um, they're not all plants that are hardy in our zone. So now we're going to be able to brag about having the opportunity to come to the Armstrong City Landscaping, City Hall New Landscaping, and, and take note of the plants that will be hardy in our area as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, we really appreciate the fact that we're getting that word out about being wise with our water. I think there's only one person maybe in the Okanagan that hasn't got that message and that would be Mother Nature. So if we could change some messaging so that she can understand that we need her help to be totally productive with our efforts, I think we, we need everybody's help with that. So thank you everybody. Just one last thing. Our Armstrong Communities in Bloom are um, environmental criteria. We're trying to find ways to promote the water-wise use, and we came up with these signs. Um, we had neighborhoods that people were harvesting their rainwater, just in barrels. It doesn't have to be expensive, just at the bottom of your, your eaves drop. But the neighbors were giving them the gears. Is that upside down? No, it's okay. <laughs> their neighbors were giving them the gears about watering those prized tomato plants in the fall when there was problems with water, but if you have your own water and you can dip into your rain barrel, bingo. So we're, uh, we're promoting this and we have signs available for people to put on their yards in Armstrong. And if you want to copy that idea, it's fine too. Mm, so thank you. Good idea. <laughs>